Yeah, I'll announce it in the middle. What is it? The 14th or something? Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, I know. It's a good thing. You going to Arizona? Man. Yeah, yeah. That's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll have to watch us on Facebook then, you know, watch our services. Well, I'd like to come out. Yeah, you can watch it. Yeah. All right. Well, good morning. <clears throat> How is everybody? Good. Uh, we're going to move our announcements to the to the middle of service when we take up uh, tithes and offering, but just a, a, a few highlights. Uh, we had a great time Friday at the singing uh, that was here. I hope everybody enjoyed that, and uh, so it was just wonderful. It was fantastic, and uh, of course, you've seen on the screen, there's a, in the church in the back, that we're, we're receiving donations for our, our landscaping efforts, so uh, feel free to, if you're able, to just um, participate in, in that giving. But uh, I, I, I want to move kind of in, directly into service this morning. I know, um, you know, some of us may have had a tough week or we, we've not. We've had a great week, uh, but we've come to God's house to celebrate and, and to worship. So uh, we want to just kind of move right into that. So I'm going to open with a, a scripture reading from Psalm uh, 116. And uh, I'm, I'm going to read from here, and uh, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along, but this will serve to, to open our service. But this is what the Word of the Lord says. I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because He inclined His ear to me, therefore I will call on Him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of hell laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, He saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And this is what I want us to hear this morning, these next few verses that we should focus on. What shall I render to the Lord for all of His benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will... Pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. And so God has been so good to us. A lot of us, uh, uh, you know, we've been saved from death. We've been saved from the power of sin. And, and so the psalmist right here asks, what can we do to repay the Lord? And it's interesting. He says, I'll lift up my cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. So all we bring to the Lord is we cry out, Father, again, fill my cup. There's nothing that we could ever do to repay God for what He's done in our lives. So what we do when we come together and, and worship, we're saying, Lord, I call on Your name. Fill me again with Your grace. Fill me with Your Spirit. And so this morning, that's what we should be moving towards, calling upon the name of the Lord to fill us. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for just filling us with your spirit, for saving us, for blessing us, Lord. And Father, I pray that uh, your presence would be magnified in our lives this morning. And let your presence be magnified in the service this morning, Jesus. And Lord, as we look to you, thank you so much for all you've done. And Lord, we could never repay you. And so, Jesus, we say, bless your holy name. Come quickly. Fill us, refresh us with your presence, with your spirit. Conform us to your image. And may your name be glorified and magnified in this place this morning. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Right. Yep. 
Now, Miss Abigail of Asbury, would you please come up and lead us in worship? Good morning. How are you? I know. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, we're going to take prayer requests and praise reports. Wonderful. Kenny Browning. Who was that? Okay. 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 
Okay. Okay. Kathy, who did you say? Okay. And Kathy, who did you say? Okay. Bow our head. Oh, Regina, I'm sorry. Ben, okay. Mm -hmm. Out of the park. She did. Mm -hmm. She did. Right. We're proud she's right. ours. She did. Yeah. 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 Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. Lord, we're so uh, thankful and grateful to be here in your house this morning, Lord, and to be with our church family, to worship and praise you, Lord. Um, Lord, you tell us in your word that you won't forsake those who seek you. So, Father God, we're seeking you this morning. Lord, by looking at this list, there are people on our hearts that are sick and they're grieving and they're hurting, Lord, and they need a touch from you. So, Father, we just lift up this list of, of prayer requests. Uh, Kenny Browning, um, Dork Family, Kay and Bob Hudson, um, Gary Gooden, Bobby Pierce, uh, Diana Barkley, Clyde Avery, the Rogers family, um, Leslie's grandmother, um, Mary's brother AJ, uh, Joyce Bennett, uh, Bill Sullivan. Um, we pray for uh, Abigail's mom's guest, Libby, Lily. I'm sorry. And so, Father, we just lift up all of these people that are, that are in need, that are hurting, that are, their bodies are wracked with illness. Lord, we just lift those up to you this morning, Lord, for healing. They need you. They need a touch from you. Uh, and, Father God, we, just, we have praise re reports as well, Lord. We're just thankful that our church is growing and that we're seeing your mighty works in this church, Lord. That's evident by the landing starting this week, Lord. I just pray your blessings over this program, that you'll bring the teenagers and the, and the kids to us to help us to, to uh, minister to them and to, to learn more about you and, and develop that personal relationship with you at a young age, Father. And we also thank you for the blessings that we experience from Friday night, Lord. We thank you for, for the work that you did here and that your spirit moved within us and among us. And we're so, so thankful for, for that evening, and we hope to have many more events like that uh, in your house. And so, Father God, I just ask that you just bless this service, that you just open our eyes and our ears, and let us to be receptive to your word, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Well, uh, before we take up offering, I just want to uh, mention this week we took our uh, donations and, and gifts to Taylor County Campbellsville Head Start, and they were just really thankful and blessed. So thank you all very much for those that gave and contributed and, and 
they were just so excited that, that a church in, in their community uh, just had that much compassion for them and, and showed that we just showed them that we're here and whatever they need, we'd be glad to bless them. So we had a great time with, with the kids and, and it was just phenomenal. And again, thank you guys very much. You all made it possible, all of us together. And, and that's another thing I just want to say, uh, the volunteers here. Uh, at Asbury, you guys are out of this world. You all, I've never been a part of a church or seen a church where the people just come together and just take it upon themselves to serve. So I just want to say that, you know, you guys, you guys were the real hero Friday night. Uh, well, Amanda Joe too. I can't, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Amanda Joe up here, then everybody else. Is. Yeah. Um, as our ushers are coming forward, I just want to highlight a few announcements. Our Fall Fest will be October 21st uh, at 2 p.m. And then uh, we'll meet here at the church at 2 o'clock on the 21st. Uh, and we're hosting the Isaiah House graduation on October the 27th. Uh, and then the Rise Up Band will be here, I think, the 14th. Sunday the 14th, the Rise Up Band. It'll be like a recovery Sunday. Uh, and then our charge conference will be Sunday night uh, at 6 p.m. on November the 4th. So, And then tonight, uh, of course, Bible study will be in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're looking at the spiritual gifts, so please come out for that. But let us pray for the offering. Father, thank you so much for being so good to us. And Lord, uh, we just uh, give back. We give sacrificially and we give joyfully so that your work continues to be uh, to be done here at Asbury. And so bless those that give, bless those that are not able to give, and Lord, just bless uh, the work of your kingdom that's taking place here. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, if you guys would stand and uh, help me worship this morning. There's nothing worth more that would ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope, your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and feel the atmosphere your glory god is 
is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. We need your presence, your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that would ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope, Jesus. Your presence, Lord. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here. Come flood this place and feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of oh, holy spirit you are welcome here. Come flood this place and feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God, it's what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. You are the love of my life, and you are the hope that I cling to. You mean more than this world to me. I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. I wouldn't trade you for riches untold. You are, Lord, you are my everything. I wouldn't take one step without you. I could never go on. I couldn't live one day without you. You see, I don't have the strength to make it all my own. Cause you are the love of my life, Jesus. 
You are the only hope that I cling to. You mean, you mean more than this world to me. I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. I wouldn't trade you for riches untold. You are, Lord, you are my everything. I wouldn't take one step without you, no. Because I could never go on. I couldn't live one day without you. You see, I wouldn't have the strength to ever make it on my own. No, Jesus, you are the love of my life. And you are the hope that I cling to. You mean. You mean more than this world to me. I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. I wouldn't trade you for riches untold. You are, Lord, you are my everything. I wouldn't take one step without you. Cause I could never go on. I couldn't live one day without you, Lord. You see, I wouldn't have the strength to ever make it on my own. No. Jesus, you are the love of my life, and you are the only hope that I cling to. See, you mean, you mean more than this world to me. I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. I wouldn't trade you for riches untold, Jesus. You are, Lord, you are my everything. You are, Jesus, you are my everything. Amen. So, Father, thank you so much, Jesus. Lord, you are our everything. Lord, this, this world holds nothing. It holds nothing for us, Jesus, but it's you and you alone. We worship you. We thank you for your presence. It's in this place right now. Lord, I pray that you anoint me to preach your word this morning, Jesus. Holy Spirit, give me the words to preach and to speak that would touch our lives. Holy Spirit, open our eyes, open our ears to hear what you would say to us this morning. And conform us to your image through your word, by your spirit, and for the glory of your son. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to be reading verses 33 
through 37 this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. The title of this morning's message is Simply Said. Simply Said. Verse 33, these are the words of Jesus. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And this is the word of the Lord. So we've been doing the Sermon uh, on the Mount series, and, and Jesus has been going through and Uh, Remember that he's declared the good news of the kingdom. And he's showing what it means to be a new creation. And he's showing in this kingdom that the pure of heart are actually elevated. And servants and those who uh, desire to see righteousness in the world, they're actually elevated in this kingdom. And it runs opposite against the world. And then, so what he's been doing is he's going to lay out the law. He says, this is what... Scripture says. This is what the law of Moses says. And then he doesn't nullify it. He doesn't say that's obsolete. But what he does is he lays down his teaching right next to it. He says, but I say this. And this, what he teaches, is to shed light on why this was here. So he expounds upon the purposes of the law. And what he does is he gets at the deep issues. This is not just about behavior modification. This is not about don't lie, don't commit adultery, don't commit murder. This is about there's something going on in your heart that needs to be addressed, it needs to be corrected, and it needs to be made new. And so his, the, 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 the whole point is to love God and to love your neighbors. And uh, these past few weeks, we went through some pretty serious issues with lust and anger, adultery and things, and uh, so on and so forth. And so this week we come to a point, and it's about oaths. And so you may be thinking, I'm glad. that I don't know when the last time I took an oath was. If anybody ever takes them anymore. And when I was preparing for the sermon, I was like, God, at least we're not talking about adultery anymore. Or, or lust, I get a week off. But not so fast. This is actually, this part about oaths is about Uh, our speech and about not using so many words when we talk. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. But this is about living a life of simplicity, of honesty, and it's about integrity. And so I've got some some pictures here. Mark, do we have the iceberg pictures? Yeah. So we're going to put something up on the screen here. So these are uh, pictures of icebergs, and you guys may have seen them before, but you know the concept. So an iceberg, you can see a little bit of it above the water, but underneath the water, it it can be much more massive than what you see. And so what Jesus is doing here, it's very much the same thing. He's saying, don't just look at what's above the water, about how people live their lives and what they do. There's something deeper going on. And Jesus wants to get down to the core. And that's what he's focusing on. Uh, focusing on. And, and, and this is all about perception. When you see with the eyes of Jesus, and when you hear what he's saying, he's getting down to the root issues. He's getting to the heart of the matter. That's what he's been doing ever since we've uh, t- turned to study and to, to, to learn about uh, th- this Sermon on the Mount. And he'll continue to do that. He's not just interested in behavior, but the root causes of behavior. So this week, what causes us, church, to bend and to distort uh, truth when we talk to other people? Why do we bend and distort truth? Why do we miss 
represent ourselves when we talk to other people. And the message this morning is, is, is not just don't lie. There's something more going on. And, and Jesus wants to expose the cause of why we twist and manipulate things and use so many so many words. And, and again, this is about being truthful and honest when we present ourselves to other people. Again, in verse 33. We're about to dive in. Again, this is Jesus, again you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. All right, so let's just pause right there. What's going on here? Well, Jesus is actually referring back to a law, so we'll use an illustration to uh, explain this. Suppose that, that you're an olive farmer. All right, you're an olive farmer, and your neighbor is an olive farmer. And you guys are always competing for the same market. And, and so you're trying to produce the best olives and, and your neighbor's trying to produce the best olives. And, 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 you know, it's just kind of a tense relationship, but you're going along okay. And then your neighbor accuses you of stealing his donkey. And you're like, well, I didn't steal your donkey. And, and, and so what he does is he says, I'm going to go to the elders. And this is just a custom that would happen. And so your neighbor would go to the elders of the town and, and he would say, look, uh, you stole, my neighbor stole my donkey. And they'll say, are you sure? And then he would say, I swear by Yahweh that my neighbor stole my donkey. And so he appeals to God and, and he's, he's using the name of God to validate his claim that you stole his donkey. So the elders, they investigate and, and they do a, a big investigation, the donkey thief, and, and, and they come out and they, they conclude that you didn't steal the donkey. It was uh, his cousin that stole it. So what happened? The neighbor used God's name, Yahweh, to validate his own stuff, his own man. He really wanted you to go down as an olive farmer or merchant. And so he used God's name to substantiate his claim, his false claim, that you stole something. And there's another name for this. It's called swearing. He took God's name in vain to validate his claim. And so that's what's going on here. And, and, and there were laws against uh, preventing this from happening. And, and we know that. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's what it means right there. To take it in vain. And, and in our culture, swearing means, means foul language. But, but in the Bible, uh, it, swearing is what your neighbor just did. Taking God's name to validate his claim. And it's pointless. It's, it's futile. It's taking that oath. That's the oath that Scripture is talking about here. That would be an oath, and, and it's to bolster the claim that you're making. So it's to take God's holiness and, and God's righteousness and His reputation and smearing it by your mess. That's an oath. That's what was going on. And you're defiling God's name, and, and, and your neighbor would be uh, abusing the reputation of, of Yahweh. So there were laws given to prevent this. This is your historical context lesson. There were laws given to prevent this from happening. It was just an abuse. It was terrible. And, and you can imagine, and that's just an awful scene, people using the name of Yahweh to bolster their false claims. And so these laws were enacted. So what ended up happening was this. People wouldn't use Yahweh's name anymore. But they would say, uh, they would use other things to bolster their claims. They wouldn't use his name, but they would swear by earth. They would swear by heaven. They would swear by, by the temple. They would swear by the gold in the temple. They would skirt around it to try to find loopholes to not uh, take the, Lord, the Lord's name in vain. And so they come up with all these crafty concepts and, and, and anything associated with God, they would then use that to bolster their claims. They were getting by on the loopholes. They were crafty. They were... Manipulative. But they didn't find a loophole. Why? Because God owns it all. 
God owns it all. In Matthew 23, Jesus states that. And, and here's what Jesus does. He shows up and he says, enough. Enough of this. Stop it. This is nonsense. You're swearing by Jerusalem. You're swearing by your head. You can't make that one single hair gray or black or white. But, but, but some of us do. Some of us have coloring that we try to do. I don't do that. But back then, you didn't have red, red kin or, or, or things like that or to color your hair. Maybe you did. I don't know. But back on point. So Jesus is saying, look, you cannot swear by, by the temple or the gold in the temple. Uh, it all belongs to God anyway. And in the kingdom, it's about simple, honest truth. That we shouldn't use too many words. That get in the mix. And a lot of us do. I, I'm guilty. We're all guilty of using too many words to convolute things and, and, and to make us seem more important. And what it's doing, it's, it's corroding relationships. And this is very serious. Remember the iceberg. There's something going on here that causes us to want to elevate our importance. Dallas Willard. Uh, he, he wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy. Dallas Willard, uh, I've shared, a, 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 I think, with Mark and, and others. He was one of my favorite uh, authors. Listen to what he said, right? He wrote a book about the Sermon on the Mount. It's called The Divine Conspiracy. And this is what Willard writes. So the essence of swearing that Jesus targets here is about invoking something or someone else especially God, to make your words seem more significant and, and weighty. The aim is to impress others with your piety, or piety, which would be your, your churchiness, so, so you get what you want. It's a device of manipulation. It's designed to override the judgment or input of others in order to possess them for our purposes. It's manipulation. Or, in our culture, spin. And Jesus says, evil. The point here is that we don't live in ways that are truthful with one another. We use words as a, as a smoke screen to, to paint us in the best possible light. And, and, and we're just putting on a show and, and, and it's not truthful and, and it's exhausting and, and it's manipulative. And, and Jesus is saying, stop it. Some of you know what I mean. You're putting up a wall and, and it's a false representation of who you are and you, you want the world to see you in a certain light. And so you say certain things and, and make false claims and you associate, you name drop, you do all of these things and Jesus is saying enough. Just be who I created you to be. And this, this spin that we do, it can be an obstacle in, in every relationship and, and, and it's a habit that all of us do. And so this name dropping, is anybody, I've done that. Is it, so have you ever been in a conversation and somebody's talking and they'll throw out a name of a, of a politician or, or somebody that's important. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, the other night, uh, you know, I was talking to my friend, uh, whomever, Mike Pence. Or they'll say, you know, I, I, I was talking to, to, to my friend, you know, my good, we're going all the way back. And they'll use famous people or political figures or somebody of esteem and wealth and, and we all know what they're doing and we've done it ourselves. Used to when I was a teenager, I, uh, I would say I'm Elvis Presley's cousin. I've never admitted that publicly before. But my, my, my older brother, Rick, you know Rick, he, he's big into genealogy and I think we found some link. I think maybe we're sixth, seventh or eighth cousins. But anyway. So, that, that, so what's going on here? It's when people are, are using that person to advance their status. So, so follow me here. When I said I was Elvis Presley's cousin, I'm using Elvis Presley to advance my status. And that's wicked. It's using somebody else. It's exploiting them. 
And we may think, well, this is just, you're drawing, Pastor, you're drawing a, a hard line here, but it's, it's true. You're using this person's name to elevate your importance to someone else, and it's exploiting them. It's manipulate. It's using that person. And in the kingdom, it's not supposed to be that way. We're to be truthful. We're to be transparent. We're to be honest. Also, another reason, the second reason or way that we, uh, uh, we, we broaden our importance is embellishment. So have you ever been telling a story and the story, every time you tell it, gets bigger and broader or more impressive every time you tell it in the classic fishing story? I was talking to Larry Friday night and he told me he, taught, he caught six fish. Larry, if I were to ask you now, how many fish did you catch Friday night? Nine. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I mean? We all do that. And, 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 and you know, we just, we want to embellish it. And especially when we meet new people. When we meet new people, we, 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 we kind of want to just, we tend to just kind of draw out and to paint with beautiful colors our own story. And maybe the common link that we're trying to identify with is our struggle. And we'll highlight our struggle and, and, and amplify it and, and broaden it in order to gain a better position and favor with that person. And people do this all across the world. And, and whatever it may be, it could be wealth, it could be tons of things, but they'll embellish things in order to gain position. And we don't even notice. This is so deeply rooted that we don't even notice it anymore. But when we catch ourselves, what are we to do? We're to repent. We're to not hide and seek. And, and I want you guys this week, as we practice this in, in the world, we're, we're becoming disciples and, and we're creating disciples. Uh, we're to not hide. We're to be truthful, transparent, and honest. And if you don't know something, you don't know. If somebody asks you, uh, uh, about something and you don't have any idea what they're talking about, don't make it up. You'll look like an idiot. If you don't know something, just say, I don't know. And, and if you mess up, if you mess up, own it. Own that thing. Admit to it. If you mess up. The third thing, and this is the worst that, 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 that happens. So you've got embellishment. You've got name dropping. But the third thing that happens is people, and this happens all the time in churches, and Christians do this all of the time, they will use God's name to validate what they want to do. This is when it starts to cut a little deeper. Christians do this all the time. And so when it comes to a decision that's, that's to be made, have, have you ever heard said or have you said, I, I feel God has called me? To do this, but you've never prayed about it, actually. Much less talk to God. Have you ever said, uh, I, I feel peace about this, but, but, but really you don't care what God would tell you if he told you different than what you want to do. But you say, I feel a peace about this, to get that rubber stamp that you've prayed about it, but you've never talked to God about it. But you throw that out there. People throw that out there all the time. Now there could be, uh, of course there is, honest people who are praying and seeking God's will and God is leading them away or God is giving them a peace about a decision. But, but more than likely, uh, these people weren't serious and they, they didn't pray, they didn't fast and seek God's face for a decision and they just wanted to do what they wanted to do. So what's going on there? What's going on there? When some people say, I feel led, or, or God has called me to do it, it it's a way of, of putting up a wall. You can't question that. When I say I feel a peace about it, don't question it. You'll be a heretic. When you say, God has, has, has led me this way, how dare you question what I say. And it's a way of putting up a wall, and it's immediately saying, okay, don't ask me no more questions. Don't challenge me on this. And it's a, a way of creating distance. And Jesus says, stop it. Stop it. Don't do that anymore. And when we do that, we're not honoring and trusting 
uh, in treasuring Jesus. We're, we're using Jesus to make our, our own agenda seem holy and, and in sanctified and more important. Stuff like this happens in, in churches all the time. And, and, and they put this Jesus stamp on something like your five-year plan and, 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 and just so we feel good about ourselves, just so we can advance our own agenda. It happens. And I look, church, your pastor, I should never be about my vision for this church. Never. This shouldn't be about your vision for this church. This is about God's vision for the church. And that's what it's about. So why do we do this? Why, why, why do we feel we need to do this? Why do we use so many words? And, and what must happen to get, to get to the place where we're just simple and honest people who are truthful, simple, full of integrity? We don't need to create a smoke screen. Just being transparent and truthful. And that's what Jesus is trying to get us to look at in the last verse here. Look again at verse 37. Jesus says, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Evil. So, so what we're doing is we're hiding from each other. And, and we're hiding the truth of who we are from each other. And it's, it's corroding relationships. And we're to be truthful. So what is this truth? And, and, and so, so think of the playground bully. You're hiding something. If you're doing all this stuff, you're name dropping, you're embellishing, you're saying, God, you know, you're using God's name to validate. What's really going on? Let's get to the heart of the matter. This is the iceberg. Think about it like this. Have you all had a bully in your lives? Most of us have. You think back to grade school, you think back to middle school. And, and so the bullies always confronting you and always just terrorizing you and uh, you throwing spitballs at you, punching you, pushing you down, and mocking you and ridiculing you, making fun of you. But what's really going on? Well, at his home life, it's terrible. We don't know that his dad is abusing him, that his dad is a drunk and that he's cussing him and he's punching him. And what's on the deep inside of this bully is fear. He's consumed with, with fear and insecurity. So he wants to control what you think of him through intimidation. So that you don't see him as insecure. So that you don't see him as a victim or, or weak. And underneath it all is fear. But here's the thing, church. We are made to, to know God and, and, and to be known and to know each other. It's about relationship. But instead, we, we hide from each other. And especially we do that in church sometimes. We put up walls. So how do we get away from that? How do we move away from that? How do we get around it? Well, well, there's one word and there's one idea that's found in 1 John chapter 4. Remember Jesus. Jesus is inaugurating the kingdom and, and He's inviting the outcast and the broken and the downtrodden and, and He's making the first move and it's called grace. He's moving towards forgiveness and grace and, 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 and here's a verse, a couple verses in 1 John 4 that highlights this one word of what's going on here. And it says this. In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus is God's love. And He went and He found people. He pursued people and loved them and, and brought them out of darkness and into His marvelous light. And, and we're scared of, of, when you're scared of being known, it's like a living death because you're hiding, you're in isolation. And, but Jesus rescues us and He brings us into new life and He covers over our messes. And he addresses the core issues inside the each of us. He removes it and gives us new hearts. That's love. And we didn't ask Jesus to do this. He chose us first. He chose you. And here's the result. Same chapter. Verse 18 of 1 John 4. There is 
no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So take that verse right there, whoever fears has not been perfected in love. If you have been perfected in love, you will not fear. When people, when people see that what, what God has really done for them, it diminishes fear and it annihilates it and it wipes it away. And Jesus, He's so committed to us. And, and in spite of our flaws, it, in spite of our sins, it, and, and, and our mistakes, and our embellishment, and our, our name dropping. He's committed to you. And so I want to ask you a question as we're getting close to closing here. Do you actually believe that? Think about it. Do you believe that about yourself? Do you really believe that your Creator loves you, and, and, and that He chose you even when you were at your worst? It's not like I did anything or we did anything to earn that love. He loved us from before the beginning of time. And even at our worst, He still died for us. Do you believe that? Your failures, listen to me, good people. Your failures did not stop Him from choosing you. He chose you. When you belonged to Him, He died for you. And He took your sin and your mistakes into himself and has given you his righteousness. And, and what First John says here is if you can get this in your mind and, and get it into your heart, it will destroy all fear. And you won't feel the need to use too many words. You won't feel the need to name drop, to embellish, or to speak Christianese just to distance yourself from your brother or sister. And when you really know how much Jesus loves you and cares for you, it won't matter to you what other people think. Who cares? As Amanda comes to the piano, I'll leave you with this. You remember that your identity is determined by Jesus. Your identity is determined by Jesus and we can pray that He would remake us and He will remake us and He'll give us a new heart and make us to be truthful and honest people. So as Amanda begins to play, we're going to take communion this morning. And this is a time to really allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart. And if you're guilty of using too many words, if you, through the course of this message, if you're like, ouch, that's me, now is the time to just let it go and to turn to Jesus. And that's what coming to the table is about. You come to the table, and, and we know that Jesus, on that night, he was eating with his disciples before He was to be crucified. What was about to take place is He was about to die for the sins of His children. He was about to die for those who used too many words. He was about to die for those who had ever rebelled against Him and hated Him. He was going to reconcile them into Him. I'm going to ask Leslie to come up and help me serve communion this morning. Father, I know that as we're moving toward this time of the service, I pray, Lord, that your spirit just be here. Lord, I pray over uh, these elements. Let this be a means of grace, Lord Jesus. Thank you for drawing us unto you, Lord. And impart your grace and your spirit on this ceremony and upon these elements and into our lives. And on that night as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, 
gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant that's poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Won't you come? The invitation is open. To come and to receive and to offer your life up to Jesus Christ. In and out of situation, the tug of war at me. All day long I struggle for the answers that I need. When I come into his presence all my questions become clear and for that sacred moment no doubts can interfere in the presence of Jehovah, He's God Almighty, Prince of Peace, Trouble. Vanish. Hearts are made while in the presence of the key through his love, the Lord provided a place for us to rest a place to find the answers in the hour of distress now there's never any reason for you to give up in despair no no just slip away and breathe his name he will surely meet you there in the of Jehovah is God Almighty Prince of Peace Troubles Vanish, hearts are mended while in the presence of the King in the presence. Of Jehovah, he's 
God Almighty. Prince of Peace, troubles vanish, hearts are mended while in the presence. Of the King, while in the presence of the you to come back to Bible study tonight, and I'm so thankful for what God is doing here today in our lives. Let's pray. Father, love you so much. You're so dear and you're so precious to us, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray, make your face shine upon you. Light our paths and fill us with joy and peace overflowing. And let us, Lord, to always speak simple words, to be truthful with one another, to be honest, and to be transparent. Help us always, Lord, to spread the good news of your gospel and to be a light in this dark world. And be with us this week. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. 